at 0300 local time on June 6, 2025. 17 Ukrainian OSA drones converge on Engels Air Base like wolves circling prey. They've been flying for six hours straight, covering 750 kilometers of hostile territory without GPS, without communication between them, and without any human control for the last 30 minutes. In just a few minutes, their AI systems are about to demonstrate how some parts cobbled together from AliExpress can beat a $500 million air defense system and ground a nuclear bomber fleet. The lead drone's thermal camera locks onto heat signatures of the fuel depot. But this isn't some amateur hour operation. This sensor feeds data to a neural network trained on 10,000 satellite images of the Crystal fuel depot. The AI doesn't just recognize the facility, it understands it. Tank configurations, pipeline layouts, everything. Through the grainy 640 by 480 pixel image, four massive circles glow white hot against the cold ground. The AI's edge detection algorithm outlines each tank, assigns them identifiers, and runs a temperature analysis. Tank number four reads 15.7 degrees Celsius. Tank number seven, 12.1 degrees. Tank number 12, 11.8 degrees. Tank one, 13.2 degrees. That 3.6 degree difference tells the whole story. Tank number four was recently filled, meaning it had maximum vapor pressure, maximum volatility, and maximum destruction potential. Here's where the distributed intelligence gets scary. Each of the 17 drones runs this exact same analysis independently. No central command, no voting system, just 17 identical brains reaching 17 identical conclusions. Tank number four gets hit first. This independent thinking extends beyond simply identifying the target. Each drone adds its serial number to its approach vector. Drone 1 will attack from bearing 270. Drone 2 from 275, a 5-degree offset that creates overlapping blast patterns while preventing mid-air collisions. It's like two people tossing rocks at the same target from slightly different spots. Close enough to hit hard, but not so close they bump into each other on the way in. As the drones close the base, the cellular connection shows one bar. At this range from the Ukrainian border, the hijacked Russian SIM cards strain to maintain contact with the towers. In 30 seconds, when the drones dive below 50 meters for their final approach, they become fully autonomous and locked in on their final targets. The operators in Kreev are about to become spectators to their own operation. Each drone's Chinese flight controller, a knockoff of the Pixhawk that costs $89 on AliExpress, runs collision avoidance calculations 10 times per second. Ultrasonic sensors create an invisible 2-meter bubble around each aircraft. When turbulence pushes them together, micro-adjustments keep them apart. It's been working great so far, it just needs to work for five more minutes. At 10 kilometers, the formation begins to shift. What started as a loose gaggle transforms into an attack matrix. Imagine a flock of birds suddenly aligning into a perfect V. Only this isn't about saving energy. It's about maximizing destruction with zero interference. The AI has calculated optimal impact angles based on tank construction. Seven drones climb to 80 meters. They'll dive onto the tank roofs where the steel is thinnest. Five maintain 50 meters to strike the upper walls where the vapor collects. Five descend to 30 meters to target the lower sections, where the structural welds are weakest. The S-400 radar beam sweeps overhead at 0301 local time. Passing through the space the drones occupied two seconds ago, the operator sees nothing. The drones are below his radar horizon, hidden by the Earth's curvature. But something feels wrong. The night is too quiet. No commercial traffic, no military transports, even the birds seem to have vanished. In the lead drone's memory, a simple timer counts down. At predetermined coordinates, the autopilot will take over completely. No human can abort. No jamming can confuse it. The drone will execute its final instructions with the mindless dedication of a wind-up toy. Point nose at tank number four. Maintain 42 meters per second. Detonate on impact. The cellular signal drops to zero bars at 0302. 17 drones simultaneously switch to full autonomous mode. 17 explosive payloads committed to their targets. 17 algorithms that can no longer be reasoned with, 
bargained with or stopped by anything short of a miracle. As the drones head toward angles, the fuel depot sits protected by an air defense network that costs more than Ukraine's entire drone program. The first layer is the S-400 battery positioned 3 kilometers northwest of the depot. This $500 million system can theoretically engage ballistic missiles in space, stealth fighters at a range of 400 kilometers, and cruise missiles that hug the terrain. The 92N6E fire control radar pumps out enough energy to microwave a turkey at 10 kilometers, but physics doesn't care about marketing brochures. At the drone's current altitude of 50 meters, the S-400 can't see them until they're 28 kilometers away, and that's in perfect conditions. Tonight, with ground clutter from the buildings and temperature inversions bending the radar waves, the range is reduced to 20 kilometers. Radars hate looking down through clutter. Buildings, trees, and pockets of hot and cold air scatter the signal. It's like trying to find your keys after your wife cleaned the house. Even if you know where they are, you can't find them. By the time the drones appear on the scope, they'll have less than five minutes until impact. Plenty of time if you're tracking a single fighter, not nearly enough for a swarm you can't even pick up on radar. The S-400's engagement computer runs through its threat library. 10,000 different aircraft and missile signatures painstakingly collected over decades. An F-15 at 50 miles? Got it. An air-to-surface missile? No problem but a basic quadcopter with the radar signature of a large bird moving at the speed of a Cessna? That's not in the database. The system classifies it as unknown or low priority, and even the S-400's backup has problems. Four Panzer S-1 units ring the depot like guard dogs here, here, the third one over there, and one here. Each one costs $15 million and bristles with 12 57E6 missiles and twin 30mm cannons. The marketing videos show them swatting cruise missiles and smart bombs from the sky with casual efficiency. What they don't show is the minimum radar cross-section required for an effective engagement – 0.1 square meters. The OSA drones flying towards them have an RCS of 0.01 square meters. 10 times below that threshold. While theoretically not impossible to hit a target that small, it would be like trying to take out a mosquito with a hunting rifle. Even while the Panzer's thermal imager spots a drone, the engagement solution is a nightmare. The 57E6 missile needs continuous radar illumination to guide it to the target. But trying to paint a plastic drone with radar is like trying to spotlight a black cat in a coal mine. The command guidance link breaks, re-establishes, and breaks again. The missile's proximity fuse, calibrated for aircraft made of aluminum and steel, often fails to detect composite materials at all. The Russians know drones are a problem. That's why they've surrounded every strategic facility with Pole 21 GPS jammers, creating electromagnetic bubbles that should send any Western drone spinning off course. The system pumps out false GPS signals that makes receivers think they're somewhere over the Pacific Ocean. But the Russians didn't account for one thing. The OSA drones navigate like it's 1943. No GPS, just magnetic compass, accelerometers, and dead reckoning. The jamming that would cripple a million-dollar surveillance drone means nothing to these flying lawnmowers. You can't jam what isn't there. It's like bringing a computer virus to a knife fight. And unfortunately for the Russians, that's exactly what they didn't expect. You see, at this base, there are a dozen cylindrical tanks, each 20 meters in diameter, holding 2,000 tons of fuel each. The designers in 1962 spaced them just 30 meters apart, close enough that maintenance crews could share equipment, far enough apart that a single bomb couldn't take out two tanks. Of course, they were thinking about B-52s dropping steel bombs, not drone swarms with shaped charges. The automated fire suppression system looks impressive in the control room. Green lights indicate that 50,000 liters of foam are ready to deploy, with deluge nozzles spaced every 10 meters and heat sensors monitoring for the slightest temperature spike. What the green lights don't show is that the foam concentrate expired, or that half the nozzles are clogged with rust or that the system was designed to handle one tank fire, not simultaneous explosions. 
By this time, the drones are 15 kilometers out and closing. On radar screens across the base, operators see the usual clutter. Migrating birds create false returns. Temperature layers bend radio waves into ghost signals. Somewhere in that electronic noise, 17 actual threats maintain perfect formation. Invisible not because they're stealthy, but because they're too simple to see. At 0303, a radar operator watches a contact materialize on his Panzer S1 display, which gives him chills. Eight kilometers out, altitude 50 meters, speed 151 kilometers per hour. His training kicks in. That's too slow for a missile, too fast for a bird, too low for anything that should be there. He slews the electro-optical turret onto the bearing and switches to maximum zoom. The thermal imager shows a small heat signature against the cold ground. Four rotors, a central body, definitely a drone, but smaller than anything in his threat database. Then he sees another, and another. His mouth goes dry as he counts 17 contacts spread across a three-kilometer front. The range counter spins down, seven kilometers, then 6.5. At current speed, impact in 130 seconds. The operator doesn't wait for authorization. His thumb mashes onto the auto-engage button, overriding safety interlocks that exist for good reasons. The first 57E6 missile explodes from its launch tube in a fountain of fire and smoke. The solid rocket motor accelerates it to Mach 2.8 in three seconds, racing toward the lead drone. But something's wrong. The radar return flickers like a dying light bulb. The missile's command receiver struggles to maintain a lock on a target that barely exists in an electromagnetic spectrum. At 2.1 kilometers from the drone, the proximity fuse makes its calculation. It's looking for a big enough RCS to trigger detonation. But the OSA drone is too small. The fuse decides this isn't a valid target. The million-ruble missile streaks past, missing by three meters, close enough that the drone wobbles in the supersonic wake, but not close enough to do any damage. The battery fires again, but now the drone executes a pre-programmed pop-up maneuver. It climbs 20 meters in two seconds, then dives back to 30 meters. The missile's guidance computer, expecting predictable aircraft behavior, loses track completely. Another million rubles of precision engineering sails off into the darkness. Across the depot, three other Panzer batteries open fire. The night sky transforms into a pyrotechnic show as missiles chase ghosts. Tracers from 30mm cannons create golden arcs, but hitting a drone-sized target at 3 kilometers with an autocannon is like trying to throw a dart at a fly buzzing around your backyard. You might get lucky, but you'll waste a lot of darts trying. The rounds self-destruct after four seconds of flight, creating puffs of black smoke that mark their failure. The Tor M2 system activates its phased array radar sweeping for targets, but it faces the same problem. The drones are below their minimum engagement zone. The system, which should track 48 targets simultaneously, can barely see one. The operator watches contacts flicker in and out like fireflies, never solid enough for a weapons-grade lock. At 0306, pure luck intervenes. A missile's proximity fuse happens to catch a drone during a turn when it presents its maximum cross-section. The warhead detonates, sending 50,000 tungsten fragments through the air. The drone disintegrates in an orange flash, raining burning plastic across the step. 16 drones, now inside three kilometers, inside minimum missile range. The only option is the twin 30-millimeter cannons, but they're aimed at its own fuel depot. One stray round, one ricochet, and he might do the enemy's job for them. The formation adjusts with machine precision. The remaining drones spread out further, forcing the defenders to adjust their fire. Some climb to attack angles, others dive toward the deck. The swarm has lost one member, but retained its purpose. The algorithms don't mourn, they just recalculate. At 0307, the defensive fire slackens, missile stocks depleted gun barrels glowing from sustained fire, hit probability calculations showing single digits. The defenders can only watch as 16 drones enter final attack runs, each one locked onto its destinated portion of the fuel depot. At exactly 0308, the lead fuel drum slams into tank number four. The 3.2-kilogram warhead, shaped like an inverted copper cone, punches through eight millimeters of steel roofing as if it were aluminum foil. 
The detonation occurs 0.3 seconds later, after the warhead has penetrated deep into the vapor space above 2,000 tons of aviation fuel. The physics of what happens next is both beautiful and terrifying. The explosion creates a pressure wave traveling at 2,800 meters per second through the fuel-air mixture. This isn't a Hollywood fireball. It's a detonation that converts liquid fuel into expanding gas faster than the tank can contain it. The roof doesn't just blow off, it transforms into a 15-ton steel frisbee, spinning through the air before crashing down 200 meters away. Tank number four's walls peel back like a banana, releasing a tsunami of burning fuel. The fuel, heated to 1,800 degrees Celsius, flows across the containment berm, designed to prevent leaks, not catastrophic failure. Within seconds, the inferno reaches the manifold connections to tank number five. Steel pipes rated for 20 atmospheres of pressure become fuses, leading to the next explosion. The second drone impacts tank number one 10 seconds later, then tank number seven, then tank number 12 each strike precisely timed to create maximum cascading failure. The depot's automated fire suppression system activates, pumping foam at 10,000 liters per minute. But it's like spitting on a volcano. The foam exhausts in 90 seconds, having barely covered a quarter of the burning surface area. The heat is beyond comprehension. At 100 meters from the fires, the radiant energy reaches 50 kilowatts per square meter enough to ignite wood spontaneously. Fire trucks arriving from Engels can't get closer than 500 meters before their paint starts bubbling. The crews watch helplessly as their thermometers max out. Inside the depot's underground pipeline network, fuel continues flowing from undamaged tanks toward the fires, feeding them like arteries supplying a heart. Emergency shutoff valves, designed in the 1960s, fail one by one as their seals melt. Each failure adds thousands more tons of fuel to the inferno. At 0318, tank number six suffers what's known as a bleave, boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. The tank doesn't just burn, it detonates. This isn't just fuel burning, it's the specialized fuel blend required for TU-160 and TU-95MS strategic bomber operations. The chemical additives that prevent fuel from freezing at 50,000 feet make it impossible to substitute regular aviation kerosene. For the price of a modest apartment in Moscow, Ukraine just reached out 750 kilometers and grounded Russia's nuclear bomber fleet. Every airbase commander from Murmansk to Vladivostok is now making the same calculation. If plastic drones can fly 600 kilometers and Moscow is only 700 kilometers away, what comes next? Bye for now.